Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Hoffmann, for the introduction. Dear um, Lukas Bersma, also hello, and dear ladies and gentlemen, I'm um, going to talk about cryo today. So, my conflict of interest. There are new technologies that are emerging, and the data we are being presented with, they're just incredible. There is a high durability, good quality of lesions, extreme good safety profile, especially with PFA. We have fast workflows, and we have all those sophisticated approaches with ultra high density mapping and toggling between energy sources. And we are pretty high on the hype cycle, and maybe have a little bit of a peak of inflated expectations. So we wonder, is there still a role for cryoablation these days? And and can we take it to the next level? So what is the value of cryoablation scientifically seen? And I think we first need to look at the EastAFNet study because this has really changed our practice because this is data that shows us that early rhythm control is associated with less cardiovascular outcomes in patients with risk factors. So the new goal of AF management is really early rhythm control and we need optimal use of resources and application of effective and efficient tools to facilitate this. And we know that, I've shown this before today on this podium, that AF is a progressive disease, and we need to treat it early. And Jason Andrade was able to publish this in the New England Journal, that with cryoballoon ablation, you can prevent progression of atrial fibrillation better than with the use of antiarrhythmic drugs. And not only can you prevent AF progression, you can also reduce hospitalization of our patients, even in this very young and healthy cohort of paroxysmal AF patients in a follow-up of 36 months. There have been three trials that have been published in the recent years, cryo first, early AF, and stop of AF first. And the last two have been published in the New England Journal of Medicine. They all target first-line ablation in patients very early in their disease with a median time from first AF diagnosis with one year. And all the trials together included 724 patients that have been randomized to either cryoballoon ablation or to antiarrhythmic drugs without any prior treatment. And the follow-up, of course, was different, but what you could see in the meta-analysis was that over all trials, Cryoballoon ablation was superior to antiarrhythmic drugs in establishing sinus rhythm during follow-up and to significantly lower atrial fibrillation burden and to improve quality of life. I know there's a lot of talk going on about safety of thermal ablation now, and we are all scared to use thermal ablation maybe, but the most feared complication is atrial fistula. But when we look at the data and the pod AF study that has been published by Roland Hiltz, shows us very nicely that, yeah, there is a, a low, low, low rate of atrial fistula, but it is even lower in cryoablation as compared to radiofrequency. And when we talk about phrenic nerve palsy, how evident is that actually? And we see it from the Yeti registry that in over 17,000 patients, the rate of persistent and permanent phrenic nerve palsy was 0.06%. Also, from an analysis of the very well-known landmark trial from Karl-Heinz Cook, the Fire and Ice study, we have analyzes regarding the cost efficiency. And what we see is when compared to RF ablation, cryoballoon ablation was associated with a reduction in resource use and paper costs. And that was most likely due to reduced rehospitalization and reduced repeat ablations. Also, when putting a simulation over the freeze cohort, and you would want to perform three ablation procedures in your lab on a day. And we would go through either you do all of them with cryo or all of them with RF. What do we see? We see that when we do cryo, three cryo balloon ablations, we are shorter in time and it's more predictable. There are five times less cumulative overtime and more hours left in the lab to do other things or to teach your staff and educate them. There is a very steep learning curve for cryoballoon ablation. Within a short amount of time and just one trimester, you can significantly reduce your procedure and your fluoroscopy times, which is shown on the left. And when you look at over the procedures, around 20 to 30 procedures, I put this line here, you can pretty much see that there's no more, much more of a learning curve in regards to procedure time and fluoroscopy duration. And even if you want to advance to PFA, 
It is better if you've been a cry user before. This is data from the Euphoria trial, and the slide was given to me by Boris Schmidt, where you can see that you're not only faster and you need less fluoro when moving from cryoballoon ablation to PFA, but you can also see that you cause less complications in your patients and you have less reconnections of pulmonary vein. The reproducibility of cryoballoon ablation and paroxysmal AF has been shown over and over again. These are single center studies, and of course they all have different sorts of rhythm monitoring, but they all report the same outcome, which lies around 80%. And why is it like this? Why does cryoablation deliver reproducible results? It is because we do have predictors for ablation success. And I want to see this for different technologies as well. But here we know in a study, on the left side you see it, where we look at PV durability in patients coming back for reablation, we can see that in patients with isolated veins, we have shorter time to isolation, we are faster in reaching lower temperatures, and the minimal temperature reach is lower. So this was also shown in the multivariate regression. And looking at 1,000 procedures from Frankfurt on the right, you could see that a short freezing time was associated with reconnection, but also a fast time to isolation was associated with PVI durability. So we know that when we target a vein with cryo-balloon ablation and we see our parameters during the procedure, we are very well aware of what is going to happen in the future and if this vein is going to be isolated. Also, it is safe to perform cryoballoon ablation under deep sedation. This is a study from us where we compared it to PFA, and we see we need less propofol, less midazolam, and less sofentanil, although our patients in the cryoarm were significantly more obese. And I think you've all seen this slide, which is making my talk much easier, because we have the randomized data that shows that pulse rate ablation is not superior to thermal ablation, including the cryoballoon, in the ADVANT trial that has been published in New England Journal. But what is the scientific impact of cryo? And here I just want to show you the last years where you can see that more than 2,000 peer-reviewed publications have been or can be found on cryo-balloon ablation. And after the already mentioned fire and ice trial, it was implemented into the AF guidelines to be as effective as ARF for PVI. But that's not all. It doesn't stop here. It continues. And what we are doing in Hamburg, we have a randomized study, the Emerge Cryo study, where we even want to push forward. It's a two-arm, randomized, open-label, but blinded endpoint, multi-center study, where we randomize first-line ablation from patients that appear in the emergency department. And they receive cryo-balloon ablation or antiarrhythmic drugs within two weeks after showing up in the ER. So that we hope we can find a close the gap of those patients presenting to the ER and presenting with very early, even maybe the first diagnosis of AF. All patients have a loop recorder implanted and they are being followed up for three years. Also, EAST goes to the next level, EAST High, to investigate ablation, which was very low. It was only 20% in the initial trial that patients with early rhythm control received ablation. And in the next level, we will look into this with AF ablation in Germany with the AFNet study, and it will randomize patients to cryoablation. And then, of course, there's also other things going on in Europe. So, but how is it about enhancing the experience that we're having, and what new innovations are there? There's a new console, and what it gives us, I'll show you here, uh, Okay, maybe, sorry, like this, oh, okay. So we can, we have a remote, and while we're looking at our ablation curve, at this moment we isolate the vein, we can press a button on the remote. We don't have to turn around anymore, so we can maybe be a bit quicker. Maybe this can also help us to end an ablation, especially when we feel like there's phrenic nerve capture loss. And also we have a refined and optimized workflow, and we can also get the data out of our procedure pretty easy. And then, of course, Everybody will tell me, but not every anatomy is suitable for cryoablation, and we do not do pre-procedural imaging in my hospital, so we never know. <laughs> 
But what sometimes can happen, as you see here, that it's very difficult to actually get a good occlusion in the right inferior vein. But there will be a solution maybe, because the sheet that we already know is going to be there with, with two different tips of the uh, length, 13 millimeter and 20 millimeter, which might help us facing more difficult anatomies. And also to improve workflow, there is an integration of the transeptal needle and dilator into the cryo sheet, and so you do not have to exchange uh, a sheet again, which might also be safer for our patient. So let me summarize. Cryoballoon ablation is an established technology for AF ablation. Efficiency and safety are well studied and have been constantly improved over 15 years in more than 1.3 million patients and over 2,000 peer-reviewed articles. So far, no other novel technology showed superiority over cryoballoon, and from my perspective, it is not clear if we can transfer all the data that we've gathered on scientific questions like first-line ablation, early ablation, to avoid progression if we can just transfer this to other energy sources. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this very nice talk and very interesting. Are there questions for Dr. Unavadena? You very well highlighted the uh, not only safety and efficacy profile, but, but also the, uh, the reproduci reproducibility and uh, the large experience over the last 15 years. So in your institution, if you have both energy sources at hand outside a clinical study, uh, how do you allocate uh, patients to one or the other? So the very the, the, the system that we have a 15-year experience and, you know, exciting new technology, but what is your clinical practice? Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you very much for this one. So I think it depends on who's going to do, do the procedure. I know that we know PFA is also reproducible and fast and has a very short learning curve. But when I let's say proctor someone, and I have a young physician, and I have to um, look at him doing a cryoablation or a PFA. For me, it's much easier to be outside and be relaxed when I see him doing a cryo, because from the outside, I can see what he's actually doing. I can see if the vein is occluded, I can see the temperature, and I have a better feeling of control than with PFA, where I don't hold the catheter in my hands, and I don't know, is he pushing, is he really at the ostium if I don't have mapping? So maybe this answers the question a little bit on how I decide. Very good. There's a question, please. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I have a question. Based with, uh, on all the information that we have up till now with cryo, do we still need signals? That's a very good question as well. I think it really depends on your time you have, on what else you provide in your lab. So I think there is the whole point-by-point -point ablation. We need cases that are easy to be able to manually move the catheter in more complex situations, right? So if you're already trained, probably, then you don't need that and you can move on to single-shot devices, do a fast PVI, and take your time for the VT or the AT. But when you're in the beginning of your learning curve and you don't want to be an F-only ablation person at the end and you want to come want more complex things, then you also need to learn how to move the catheter, and I think then you shouldn't start with a complex case. It's just to move forward, the value yeah. of the signals, because now we're talking about PFA, and we see nothing, so yeah. it's kind of feature. That, I know, um, that's why we need to have protocols that tell us exactly what we need to do, but we don't, so with PFA, every, all the signals disappear, but then maybe we have reconnection, with RF, we see the signals disappear, but later on we also have reconnection. So, um, yeah, <laughs> I think it's an issue in both. <laughs> Sorry, maybe if I can also ask a question and challenge you a little bit, obviously. <laughs> um, there's two things in my experience. We've been more recently uh, starting with Choir Balloon for the last couple of years, and um, one thing I do still worry about is the phrenic nerve. Uh, wh how do you see that evolving now? What's your experience with that? Do we have to be afraid of that, or is that something of the past? Yeah, it is extremely rare, 
And I think it does happen, but it's usually not that it is permanent. So we have different safety mechanisms. The way we put the ECG on the patient, we do a CMAP. So we look at the electrogram because we also know that the muscle contraction that we see might decrease before we have the loss of capture. And then with the remote, I think it is much easier to stop it because you don't have to turn around or you don't have to tell another person, press stop or double stop. You can just do it yourself. So it is much faster to end the freeze. Unfortunately, I have no data about it, but I would be curious to know in the future with this new approach if we could see less. Yeah. And, and one other question. I mean, the balloon is now a, a PVI tool. Do you see that maybe with new technology or a new uh, way to use the balloon, we could also target other areas than pulmonary vein isolation? Because obviously there's still this question, what do we do beyond PVI and, and where does cryo fit in there? Yeah, I must say I'm a bit reluctant on this because I think it's a very great technology to target the vein. And then also it doesn't really implement mapping. So I, I don't like to do more than pulmonary veins without a map, to be honest. And also we would need some studies that show us what is the target that we need to address in those patients. So what, what you're telling us is really stay cool with cryo and see what happens. And uh, I think it's very important to have people know we have done over 5,000 cases, cryo cases, wow. that phrenic nerve palsy is really something that do, is not a permanent yeah. damage. And uh, with all the cautions that you described very nicely, it's very rare and it's uh, reversible. Yeah. Uh, so we're not so afraid. And we haven't seen a single uh, fistula. And I guess so. you're the ice queen, so you, you must know. <laughs> oh, that's not what I wanted to say. Yeah. Thank you no, very, <laughs> very much. <respect. laughs> Thank you very much for this wonderful talk. And Thank I you. think we have to move on. Okay.